welcome back to another episode of See the Pattern. Today we're going to be examining the evidence that underpins the Big Bang. Now when I was at school we were not taught about the Big Bang or cosmology. Instead I would spend my spare time reading up about the universe. The images of stars and galaxies would fascinate me to the point that I actually considered studying it at university. In the end, I didn't. Years later, I would be the one teaching these facts to students. We so easily take for granted the information we are given without much question. This is ironic considering we teach students that they must follow the evidence. So let's take a more critical review of the evidence that we present to students to back up the claim of the Big Bang. The first point of evidence that we provide is the expanding universe. Now we've already looked at this in last episode where we looked at Edwin Hubble's discovery that the universe itself was expanding. He measured the distances to various galaxies and through those observations he noticed that the light from the majority of galaxies was shifted towards the red end of the spectrum implying that they were moving away and in fact it wasn't that they were all at the same redshift, there was a huge variation implying that some objects were moving quicker and some were moving slower. Therefore the idea that if we rewound time that at some point the objects were very very close together. Now the problem is when he first came up with this idea the initial value that he came up with for the age of the universe was only two to three billion years and this simply wasn't enough time to develop the complexity in terms of stars and galaxies and other things that we see in our universe. Through various fudge factors that they then introduced over the many years, we've now ended up at a value of 13.8 billion years. The problem with this value is that this value still means that the oldest objects, in order to have got to where they are, had to have been moving faster than the speed of light which is not physically possible according to Einstein's laws. So the way that they get around this is that in the early universe we have space itself expanding at faster than the speed of light. Added to this is the problem with redshift which we talked about last time. We know that for an expanding universe the assumption is that recessional velocity is directly linked to redshift, a one-to-one -one relationship. In the last episode, we already looked at many examples where this one-to-one -one relationship doesn't exist. Yeah, absolutely. Movement will cause redshift, but we have seen plenty of examples of where that redshift actually is caused by something else that we do not understand putting off our measurements. This means that when we look at the universe and we see everything shifted towards the red or the majority of things shifted towards the red, we can't necessarily assume that that means that everything is moving away from us at a great speed and particularly those things which are furthest away because if there is some other process going on which is causing these objects to emit light towards the red end of the spectrum rather than towards the blue end of the spectrum depending on what it is doing rather than its movement it means our understanding of where things are is vastly different and the universe may not it may but it may not be expanding the second point of evidence is Alba's paradox. When we look out at the night sky, we observe mostly black with stars spattered across it. Now Albers, who was an 18th century astronomer, speculated that if the universe was infinite, that our night sky would be bright white. In fact, the oceans on Earth would boil as all the radiation from an infinite number of stars would be received. Indeed, when we look at the sky, we do not see this and this is often used as evidence of a finite universe. It is, however, not evidence of a Big Bang. There are a number of ways to disprove this paradox. Firstly, not having a Big Bang in no way assumes an infinite universe. It just means it's not expanding and may have existed forever. If the universe was infinite, the second law of thermodynamics states that an infinite universe as a whole cannot heat up or cool down. It can only heat up if heat is added from the outside, and in an infinite universe there is no outside. In a finite universe you could argue that if the universe had existed forever that the light from all the stars given enough time would be enough to turn our night sky white. But this argument ignores the simple fact that the first law of thermodynamics states that if a star is heating up its surroundings it has to cool down equally much itself. 
This is the conservation of energy. Now, the only thing that Albert's paradox shows us is that we live in a universe that has a fixed amount of energy, and also that in some sense it is self-organizing. Finally, the microwave background radiation. It was first discovered by Penzias and Wilson using ground-based radio telescopes. They discovered a microwave background signal across the whole sky, and this signal was very even throughout the sky. It had already been speculated that if there was a Big Bang, that such a signal would be detected, a sort of afterglow from the Big Bang. There are, however, a number of problems with firstly, the data itself, and secondly, how they interpreted this data. First, let's talk about signal to noise ratio. In order to determine if a signal is genuine, the first test must be reproducibility. The same signal must be able to produce the same image. If it cannot, then the signal is false. The more signal to noise ratio you have, the clearer the image you will have. In the original Penzias experiment, they received a signal of 6.7 Kelvin, to which they attributed 2.3 Kelvin to the atmosphere and only 0.9 Kelvin to noise. They assumed that the signal that they were receiving was coming from the universe, but they failed to look at other possible sources of the signal. Could water, on Earth, in the atmosphere, or in the oceans have produced this signal? Can we really see beyond the foreground of the galaxy into the universe? Let's start with water. It is well documented that microwave experiments on Earth are mired with problems when it comes to water. There is a clear link that shows water vapour caused the scanners that they use to register a rise in temperature. We also know that the oceans radiate both thermal and microwave radiation, but again, these were never taken into account. A water dimer consists of two water molecules loosely bonded by a hydrogen bond. Assuming that the water molecules align linearly, then the energy in the water-hydrogen bond is about 100 times greater than the molecule-to-molecule -molecule hydrogen bond. The emission of this system is therefore related to this ratio. So if the energy in the hydrogen bond is 300 Kelvin, then the emission in the water molecule to water molecule bond will be 100 times lower, i.e. 3 Kelvin. WMAP was a satellite that was launched in order to get a much higher resolution image of the cosmic background radiation. The problem was that this satellite was positioned well beyond the orbit of the Moon, at L2, and this was to ensure no interference from the Earth. The problem now is that the galactic center was almost overwhelming the whole image. In fact, it was a thousand times brighter than the fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background. Remember, they don't actually know that there is a background radiation here at all, but somehow they are able to extract the signal from the noise, the galactic center, which is a thousand times stronger. And on top of this, they also identified around 300 point sources of radiation that they had to remove. Again, these are significantly higher compared to the signal that they are trying to detect. All stars and galactic centers are capable of transmitting in the same frequency range, yet still they claim that they can see the background signal not related to all of these sources. We must really go back to the basic science here. Whenever you perform an experiment, you must account for any outside noise. Most experiments you may have conducted will have a signal to noise ratio which is greater to 1. That is normal. However, we are talking here of 0.001 or lower. The only way you can extract a signal if the noise ratio is so large is that you either can perfectly predict what the signal will do, which we can't, or you are able to control the signal at its source. Again, we cannot. It is therefore impossible to remove the galactic foreground. As you can see, this is the image that hasn't been cleaned up. So this is the raw image that shows you the strength of the galactic center, uh, our galaxy uh, compared to the background. And you can see it's bright red. So how do they remove the galactic center? Well, they divide this image into 11 sections some away from the galaxy and some in the plane. They then add or remove the signal in the different bands for each section. The problem is that each region has a different set of additions or subtractions applied to it, 
and they can vary from one region to another by a thousand percent. Worse still, they then use the data from different years, so year one and a three year average or a five year average, and they change the value of the sum. So for one year they might add it and for year three average they might subtract. And they are basically creating the image that they want by fudging and adding together the different bits in order to remove what they think the uh, galactic signal is from whatever the background is. So it's like witchcraft. So here is that beautiful image all cleaned up with a galaxy center and, and the arm removed. Magic. So how much noise was present in the image then? Well, take a look at this. This is what they claim is the noise that they were able to remove from this image. Even assuming that this is correct, they claim to have a signal to noise ratio of two to one. In this image, and personally I find it very hard to believe, even at this ratio, it is almost impossible to make out any image. And again, I'm gonna pop on screen now some examples of images which are taken at a 2.5 to one ratio. And I don't know about you, but I cannot make out any detail in any of these images. But magically, somehow they can. Again, if we compare the one year and the three year averages, so again, here's the one year average, here's the three year average. Again, one of the things we said is that data must be reproducible. So what happens when we subtract the two images away from each other? Now notice here that there is a strong difference between these two images. This shows that the so-called signal that they see is not constant, it is not consistent. They are not able to re reproduce their data. Okay, so let's summarize what we've discovered so far. So, so point one is we know that redshift does not always relate to recessional velocity. So therefore the idea that all the objects that we see are moving away from us may be false. Uh, and it means that therefore the universe looks very different to the way that we assume it is at the moment and may not be expanding. And if it's not expanding, we don't need a big bang to cause that expansion. The second one is, do we live in an infinite or a finite universe? Again, it doesn't matter. Either could be true and there is no strong evidence to support one or the other. The one thing we do know is that we live in a universe which has a finite amount of energy. Number three, the microwave background radiation. Well, I don't think we can consider this evidence at all. If we look at how poor the reproducibility is and how poor the signal to noise ratio is, I'm not sure why this is even considered evidence of a big bang. Yes, there is noise out there, but we know that there are as, as they have claimed, hundreds of objects that emit microwave radiation. So why is this strong evidence for a Big Bang? I don't think it is. So therefore the question is, if there is no Big Bang, then what are we living in? Is it a universe that was created at some point in the past? Is it a universe that has existed forever? Is it a universe where parts of the universe come into existence and other parts go out of existence? So therefore always conserving the amount of energy? We don't know, but certainly what we can say is that the evidence that supports this notion of a, of a Big Bang, I don't think is particularly strong. And again, throughout the future episodes, we will be exploring some alternative ideas that may help us to point us in a new direction. I think it's time for us to be brave, to see that the evidence doesn't stack up, the pattern doesn't match, let's abandon it. Let's find something else that may match it. Now I don't have that something else yet, but hopefully through our journey, looking at alternative ideas, we can help to come close to some ideas of what that may look like. But this is the journey that we're on, so as always, follow the evidence, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.